To kind of get started with everything, I'd like to tell a story. Would that be okay? Like, what are your options, right? <laughs> so I'm, I'm eight, maybe nine, and we are in Upland, California, and it's maybe, what is it, 60, 62? And um, at that time, there was a magazine for the young folk called Life Magazine. And, and this particular, on the coffee table in our house, was Life Magazine, and it was open. It was an expose on Venice. Until I looked at that first page, I had never heard of the concept of Venice before. And I stared at those pages of kids going to visit their kids on boats and coming back home on a boat. I, I, what? I couldn't believe it. My dad came home and I, I said, Dad, we must move to Venice. <laughs> and he said, it's going to take some work, you know, uh, with GE and everything. They don't have anything over there for me. He was very polite, but he said, I don't think we can do it. And I, 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 was, I was stunned. It was like the greatest thing that had... How could this place be? And then gradually, over time, people started telling me, John, 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 just, whoa, pump the brakes. Uh, you don't want to go to Venice. Venice is, uh, it's old, it's dirty. It, it, it floods, and when it floods, it just goes in it, and there's, John, there's rats. They're all over the place. There's just rats. It stinks. You do not, it's all, you want to talk about expensive. Just, John, Venice, no. I know it looks good, the concept, and it's great in a movie, but it's, it's not for you. And so, o over time, I guess I just went okay. The dreams are not as good as they look. Forgot all about it. Stacy and I marry. I become a pastor. 25 years into our marriage, three kids later, a man who I do not know that well says, for your anniversary, I would like you to go on a really, really nice vacation. Take up to a month. And the only condition is you have to go as a very, as very wealthy, retired people. And I said to him, I think we can do that. <laughs> and, and, and I started thinking, what were you talking, Albuquerque? He said, no, 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 think bigger. And um, uh, Mar we've always wanted to go to Martha's Vineyard. No, 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 bigger. Eventually we got to Paris in the plan and then uh, Sam Gimignano in Italy, and then Santorini, Bordeaux. A and the travel agent said, as long as you're there, have you thought maybe you'd like to go to Venice? And I'm thinking, no, I don't want to go to Venice. Have you heard about the rats? <laughs> she said, just give it a try. It's right there. So I said, okay, 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 we'll go to Venice. And um, so the day came. We had a great time in Paris. Uh, got onto the, got into the airport, and the flight was two hours delayed. And so we got to Venice eventually. And um, I guess earlier there was a big fanfare when when people came at the flight. There was bands and people excited and boats and regattas and I'm not sure what a regatta is, but it was there. <laughs> and people just having a great time. By the time we got there, there was no one there at the dock. It was pitch dark. And I thought, what are we gonna do? I, I could, we can go back into the airport. We walked like a quarter mile from the airport. And then I hear this it's a tiny little boat off in the distance, and I can see as it gets closer, there's this sketchy looking guy. <laughs> he's coming at us. I know two things for sure. He's gonna take all of our money, and I'm gonna be killed. I know that for certain. I don't know how it plays out after that, but I know that's, that's gonna happen. And he gets there, and, and 
yeah, yeah. And we get in, and he did take a substantial amount of our money. Uh, and we get in, and I go, what am I doing? What am I doing to my wife? This is our anniversary. The water's inky black. It's so late. I'm so tired that by the time we get up to the uh, hotel where we're staying, I don't even look. I just want to get up to my room, and we do. We take the bags up to the room, and it's old. The hotel, it's, it's kind of... It, Nice, but I'm not really paying attention to it, and I'm just trying to get the blankets up so the rats can't get onto the bed, you know. <laughs> the next morning, we go down for breakfast, I mean, uh, and walk down, and it's like, do you remember Saving Private Ryan, that percussive sound when he can't hear and then he can hear again? I, I still don't know what was first. I think I... <laughs> I saw this bright light through this portico and I could see gondoliers in these bright red and black shirts and then I could hear suddenly I love it, the French people, they scare me, they go, I'll kill you uncle but, but, the, <laughs> but the Italians, hey, how are you, come, come and they went and they sat us down. We were right across the famous basilica right next to St. Marco's Plaza. And we are seated right out on this little cul-de-sac on the front, right on the Grand Canal. And placed in front of Stacy and I is, is the finest cup of coffee that I've ever had in my whole life. Oh my gosh. And, and the gondoliers, it's like they're, they're doing it all for us. Yeah, beautiful. We had this wonderful breakfast. Then eventually I said, we got to get up, honey. We can't live here. We have to go. We have to move. <laughs> and so we went over to Marco Plaza and did the whole tourist thing. I had the birds on my arms. We tried on different hats. Then we wandered around just all through this beautiful town. W went over to see where Woody Allen stays when he comes to Venice. I sat, I sat where Woody sat. And... Um, <laughs> Then I look up the Grand Canal, and I hear this violinist. Um, and, and, I, and I look up the, up the Grand Canal, and there's this boat. It's a bridal party. And this gentleman is playing for this bridal party and for the bride. I'm, where am I? What's happened to my life? This is so beautiful. And it goes on like this all day, all day. We're just having the greatest time. And eventually, um, we take a gondolier ride. Not the half hour one like the common people. We take the hour and a half ride. <laughs> because we're wealthy retired people. <laughs> oh my gosh. And, it, and, the, and the guide, the, the, the gondolier says, and of course, Marco Polo lived here. You sure, why not? And Vivaldi lived here, and uh, Casanova lived here, and uh, Monet would come here in the, the, the summers. I'm thinking, if I had to do a tour of Phoenix, Arizona, I, I think that's Barry Goldwater's house over there. I think Dick Van Dyke used to come here in some of the winters. I don't, I, it's just not the same. So we're going, we go to the kissing bridge, the famous kissing bridge, and oh, Stacy, she, she's digging on me. I have gotten her to some nice digs here. And <laughs> at the kissing bridge, we are kissing like rabbits on shore leave. I mean, we are. Oh, I get, we get back to uh, this wonderful restaurant in the evening in the Grand Canal. And I'm looking at my wife through the candlelight. We have a beautiful, beautiful bottle of wine. And I'm staring at her, and she looks as beautiful as she's ever looked in her life. I had this thought. I had, I had two thoughts, actually. One didn't come to me till the next day. The first thought was this. I will steal money from a nun to get my wife back here again. <laughs> And 
And, and the next thought was this. I've been lied to by people who had never been to Venice. And that's for a little bit of what I want to talk about tonight or this morning. It may go on into the night. <laughs> Most of us in the body of Christ have been lied to by people who have never experienced grace. What you heard from Steve and what you heard from Tullian last night, uh, I, I use a term for it that you, you may be familiar with. I call it sin management. Man-made theology to fix my sin. And if I buy into it, and it is the majority report, you guys, you, you know this is the minority report still. I will focus on correcting my behavior to solve my shame. I will become addicted to trying to feel better about myself by fixing enough behavior, tamping down the wrong problem is it keeps me from growing up. It keeps my attention on me instead of allowing this new life in me to pay attention to you. The Christian life is not about changing from who I was into who I should be. The Christian life is learning to trust who Christ says I am right now on my worst day. It's interesting. Grace is the only thing that can deal with sin. I, I don't know if I can say it any stronger than that. Sin management cannot deal with sin. Only grace. I love that Romans um, 6.14 says, Sin will not be master over you because you are no longer under law, but you're under Grace. Sin will not be master over you because you're not under law, you're not under moralism, buck up, striving, pretend, bluffing, trying harder, grinding it out. Sin will not be master over you because you're under grace. It alone has power in my life. Now the sad flip side of that is true. Also, sin will be master over you if you try anything other than than grace. I want to read a story to kind of set up where I'm going from here on in. It's from my book on my worst day. I've got some copies out there. Uh, and, and, and what it does is kind of follows a narrative of my life. And knowing what I know about Jesus now, I kind of try to transpose it into some of my worst days along the way. So this is 1964. These days I cared uh, mostly about running fast and listening to Vin Scully describe the Dodgers on the radio and convincing, enchanting Lucille Ingle to like me. Orange trees still outnumbered homes. Life was pretty idyllic, except my fifth grade class was run by this tough kid. He had two older brothers who, for all I knew, were already in prison, or they should be. <laughs> I didn't yet know much about evil, but his family was evil. He had beaten up three kids in our class, and it was only October. He didn't hit me because he was entertained by me. One day, he informed me that we were to meet at the railroad tracks on this coming Saturday morning. These particular tracks ran through the center of town, ending at an orange Packing plant, oh gosh. For us kids, that plant was a glorious place. Upland was one of the great citrus hubs, dozen of open top freight cars with three quarters filled with oranges waiting to be sent out to places like Billings or Topeka. On late afternoons after the, uh, after the cul-de-sac wiffle ball in the front yard football, dozens of us could be found lying on our backs inside of train cars filled with huge, nearly fluorescent oranges. 
The workers didn't even care we were in there. There were so many oranges. We'd eat them until our mouths burned. Nobody had scurvy in our neighborhood. <laughs> On that Saturday, like uh, six dozen times before, I climbed the train steel ladder and dove into orange heaven, but it was early Saturday morning. No one was yet in the cars, and he followed me in. He leaned slowly against the back wall, saying nothing. He was staring at me intently, and then he pulled the steel grate to close it where the light stopped. And I experienced a sensation of being trapped for the first time in my life. He slowly informed me what he would now do to me and what I would do to him, twisted perversion that I'd never before heard or thought of. That morning changed my life. I remember little of what happened after emerging from the boxcar, how I got home, or what I did when I got there. I have no memories of him after that morning. I carry this embedded maxim which clung to me like a wet sweater all my life. No one must know what happened. I will go this alone. I, 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 I will find a way for this to never happen again. I'm going to be okay. I'm going to be okay. I'm going to be all, I'm going to be all right. And a previously innocent and playful kid walked with a limp from that thought on. <laughs> still funny, I still seem like a normal kid. I would pitch on my town's Little League All-Star team. Lucille Ingle would like me. But something insidious was going on inside, all alone inside. I've discovered since that there's a word for this silent limp. It's called shame. Um, guilt says, um, I've done something wrong. Shame says that there's something uniquely, irrevocably wrong fundamentally with who I am. And no matter what I do, no matter what schooling I get, and no matter what happens from here on in, it's not going to change. And if you stay around me too long, you'll see it. That's what shame hisses. It tries to convince me that, that we caused the evil which happened to us. It continually whispers, if anyone could know the real truth about who we are, they, 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 they would leave us or they would pity us. So we're left to bluff and posture and guard and defend. Shame teaches us to perform for God's acceptance, to keep pain for something we eventually can't even any longer name. It would take 40 years before I risked even a hint to anyone of something happening back there in those boxcars. They, they still stand, silent and rusting, a visible and definable part of Upland's past, my past. I've driven past them sub, several dozens of times, bringing my family to see the town of my childhood. No one in our car ever noticed me staring at those boxcars as we drove by. Decades after that day in the boxcar, I cling to this now, Jesus. You make no mistakes. You make even better beauty out of the most heinous. You never left my side. You hated it more than I did. You give me dignity. You continue to stand with me in the arena to protect my heart and reputation. You are redeeming and will redeem all this damage. <clears throat> you died to take away the power of the shame. Jesus. Jesus, you dropped everything to stand over me on that day when it all tur turned dark. Shame says that there's something it hisses. There's something, John, uniquely, irrevocably, fundamentally wrong with who you are. And if you look too long in the mirror, you'll see it. That's what shame tries to hiss to us. It's, it's interesting. You know where it started, where it least first got revealed in the garden. Adam and Eve. It's so interesting. The word naked, before they take the fruit, is just the word to have no clothes, to be without clothing. As soon as they take the fruit, the next time you see naked, it's a different word. It's this nefarious, dark word of feeling, 
I don't belong. What's wrong with me? What do, what, what, I, I got to defend myself. I got to bluff. I got to hide. I got to. It, it, it becomes a different word. Shame. And so, um, just as Adam and Eve, historically, uh, like clockwork, shame wants to try to get me to hide. Hide. Um, gosh, you guys. I didn't tell anybody that night. All through fifth grade, I didn't tell anyone. Through junior high, through high school, through college, all my wandering years, my hippie years, my, um, when I came to Christ, I never told anyone. I don't think God and I talked about it. I got married to Stacy. I didn't talk to anyone. I feared that if I told her, she would leave me or people would be ashamed of me or embarrassed for me or pity me. It took about 40 years. Do you know how sick that made John Lynch? Everywhere I go, I'm going, you can't know, they can't know, they can't know. Hey, how are you doing? Great to see you. Good, good to see you, Tiger. What's up, man? Hey, that's hiddenness. We made a statement in one of our books somewhere. It's less important that anything ever gets fixed then that nothing ever has to be hidden. A lot of things in that statement. It's less important that anything ever gets fixed than that nothing has to be hidden. What that's first of all saying is that nothing gets fixed. You sit on a slinky that's crimped and it'll still be crimped when you get up. Things don't get fixed. They only get healed, redeemed. So, so, so it's less important. What I want to do as a parent, as a friend, as a spouse, I want to create an environment where my family is convinced, you really mean it, don't you? There's a different consequence for me telling on myself than for getting caught. Wow, you really... Because it saves me. Hiddenness is the petri dish for sin. <sighs> Well, Daniel, if you would, put up Galatians 5.1. It was for freedom that Christ set us free. Therefore, keep standing firm and don't be subject again to a yoke of slavery. It was for freedom that Christ set you free. At first, you want to just go, are you mumbling? Why did you have to repeat that again? We get it. But he says, look, I didn't set you free so you could live trapped in religious fear and obsessions and shame-driven secrets. I long for you to experience innocent, fully breathing, light-filled, playful, purposeful freedom. He says, I want you to stand firm. What does that mean? How, how do I do that? All right. I'm standing <clears throat> firm. I am a man in firmness. How would I do that? Well, it's the opposite of what Paul has been saying has been inflicting them. Moralism, legalism, sin management. And he hates it. If, if you, you want to know exactly what it is that he's saying, stand firm, it's the opposite. It's the exact opposite of what it would enslave you. He says in Galatians 3, 1 through 5, Gosh, you foolish Galatians, who's bewitched you before whose eyes Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified? Hey, this is the thing I want to know. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law, huh? Or did you do it by hearing with faith? Hear that carefully. Are you so foolish, having been begun by the Spirit, are you, you're going to be perfected by the flesh now? Did you suffer so many things in vain? If indeed it, it was in vain... So then, does he who provides you with the Spirit and works miracles amongst you, does he do it by the works of the law, by your self-effort, by you putting on some kind of show? Or by hearing by faith? It's identity. It's living out of who Christ says I am that reigns power. And 
takes over that slavery. And if that's what it is to stand firm. And so I'll just give a quick list of who you are on your worst day. You are a brand new creation. You are Christ in you. And I can't do it except for in an Irish or Scottish accent, <laughs> for this is the manner in which God speaks. <laughs> look, look it up. <laughs> Christ in you. It means he's not over there somewhere, up here somewhere. He's in you. Fused with you. I can't tell where he leaves off and I start up. Fused down to the cellular, molecular level. He's living in me. Yet a saint who sometimes sins, not a safe sinner. The unchanging power of the resurrection pulses through you. Do you know that the most real you wants to love like crazy? The most real you doesn't want to get away with anything. Only bad religion can make me a rebel or keep me anesthetized. You were given everything you needed at the very start. You don't need to be changed. You already are. Your new heart can be trusted. Oh, people say, oh, John, no. Jeremiah. <laughs> John, 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 John. The heart is deceitfully wicked. Oh, oh yes, you can trust it. And that's, that's in the Bible, and it's true. It's just not true for you. You have a new heart. That ship has sailed, kids. Your new heart can be trusted. You have a shame-free identity. Galatians 2.20 no longer is shame able to identify me. It's not who I am any longer. I'm Christ in me. That's my identity. You're loved as much as any person on this earth. Do you know that? He cannot love you any more than he does, and he will never love you less. You are actually righteous, actually holy, right now, not someday, not maybe. I didn't say you were mature, but you are actually righteous and actually holy right now. He cannot and will not ever be disgusted or angry with you. He has like zero interest for you to perform for him at any time. He has no need for you to try to impress him in any way. He has little need for you to try to love him more, but he would love the opportunity for you to enjoy his love. Gosh. <clears throat> then we moved to, I was reading in 2 Corinthians about us being, uh, this beautiful, beautiful section about uh, us being these ministers of the new covenant of Christ coming for man to set them free. Beautiful chapter 3. And then in verse 4, he, 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 he talks about the very thing that I've been describing from all the way back in 1964. He, um, put that slide up. We who are the ministers who have been made adequate to be ministers of the new covenant, not because we've tried hard enough, but because he made us adequate. He says, we have renounced the things, look at that, that are hidden because of shame. We are the ones who can renounce those things that get hidden because of shame. Isn't that a powerful, beautiful verse? So how would I do that? I'm going to renounce the things hidden because of shame. There you go. All done now. I've renounced them. What does it mean? How do I do that? Um, I'm, going to, I'm going to give a three, 
one of the most important three words that I've ever been taught. Truth, trusted, transforms. This, this uh, Bible, I, I believe it to be um, trustworthy. But for you, it's just words until you trust them. Period. Truth, trusted, is what transforms me. I love it in Philippians 3.10 when he says, I want to know him. And he had a lot of words he could have used. One of them is uh, the word oida, which would say, I want to know him. I want to specifically, empirically, I want to know everything about him. I want to study him. I want to know where he, everything about his childhood. I, want, I just want to know. Oida is that intellectual understanding of who Jesus is. But there's another word that Paul chose. In fact, he made it up. He coined it. Epignosis. Gnosis. Experience experiential knowledge, and not just experiential knowledge, super, because the Gnostics were talking about epignosis, or gnosis, but, but epignosis, it'll knock you out of the sky, Gnostics. Such a powerful word. It says, I want to experience him. I want to let him love me in such a way that I trust him and then I get to know him, I get to cry out to him, I get to feel his presence, I get to know his protection, I get to understand where he is right with me, standing over me in one of my worst failures. So how do I renounce the things hidden by shame? There's seven things, and if you get these right, there's never seven things, by the way. <laughs> Never. You can always know it's not true if they say, and seven things. Hey, you are lying to me, aren't you? <laughs> Six is fine, eight's fine, but seven, they're lying to you. Three things. Jesus died for my sins. Jesus took my shame upon him. Hebrews 12, 2. Jesus made me a new creation. Galatians 2, 20. The implications that come out of those, if, they, if I trust them, my gosh, they change everything. Jesus died for my sins. All of them, past, present, and future. Not, not just died from, and so he goes, yeah, 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 I've died for him, but I don't like you. Never liked you. You get to go to heaven, you pray your little prayer, but um, I don't like you. When you get there, there'll be no padding on the armrest on your chair. I'm just telling you that much right now. Never liked you. No, it means he's crazy about you. He adores you. He can't remember your sins. They are as far as the east is from the west. Now, the implications of that are mind-boggling. He also took my shame story. So that's not who I am when I look in the mirror? That's not my identity anymore? Right. It's over. You had a Christ in you identity now. That's who you see when you look in the mirror. More and more every day. I've lived with that shame story for so long. That shame story motivated everything I did. How I dealt, why, why, why I was such a chameleon around people. To be free from that changes everything. And then he says, you're a new creation. You're a brand new creation. You're not this, he's up there and I'm down here. Oh yes, vermin that I am. Loser boy, loser. Loser boy going to heaven. <laughs> going to heaven, but loser boy. That game is over too. You can't ever say, I, I hate my Christ in you. And it will not go away. It will not get smaller, it will not get larger. So those three, you want to deal with shame and hiddenness. 
Truth trusted transforms. Jesus died for my sins. You're clean. Oh, to feel clean. You are. There's nothing you have to do to make it happen. Believe that. Rest in it. Jesus died for my sins. Jesus took my shame upon him. And Jesus made me a new creature. And that's it. That's all you have to do. What? That's it? Yeah, that's it. It's so hard for us to dare let that be enough. I wrote in the Two Roads message, have we been changed? Yes. As day is from night, we've been changed. I get so sick and tired of going to Christian bookstores and reading books. Men, it's time to change. You've already been changed. <laughs> and now we get to mature into who we really are. If we, if we brought a caterpillar to a biologist and asked him to describe its DNA, he would say, John, I know this looks like a caterpillar to you. But by every measurable scientific result, this is fully and completely a butterfly. Wow. God's wired into a creature looking nothing like a butterfly, a perfectly complete butterfly identity. And because the caterpillar is a butterfly in essence, it will one day inevitably, invariably display the attributes of a butterfly. The caterpillar matures into what is already true about it. And in the meantime, yelling at it to get to be like a butterfly faster will just hurt its tiny little ears. And so it is with us. God gives us the DNA of godliness for saints, righteous. God knows our DNA. He knows I'm Christ in me. And he's now saying, John, would you dare join me to believe it's true? So the outcome, the implication is sin no longer defines my relationship with God. Love. Love defines my relationship with God. The expression of my maturity is not on how little I sin, but on how much I give and receive love. If I work on trying to sin less, I won't. And I've... And I won't learn to experience love. But if I allow myself to be loved, I'll experience love. And oh, by the way, I will sin less. You see what this is? Remember Hebrews 12.1 says, you can't please God without trust. You can try to please him all day and you'll never please him enough and you'll never learn to trust. But if over here you dare, dare believe on your worst day, I just hurt my wife's heart. Not now. Yeah, now. You want me to believe that I Christ in me, that I wear a robe of righteousness right now? Yeah, right now. All right. And he says, you're doing it, kid. You're trusting me. Oh, and by the way, you've never pleased me so much in your whole life. You doggies! And I know, I know the, the, the group out in the audience the, somewhere, that Roman, uh, that Greek chorus saying, but John, if, if they believe this, won't they just go hog wild? They'll go down to the dog track, John. They'll buy cheap off-brand cigarettes and, and, and whiskey that's badly distilled. They'll go blind in one of their eyes. No! That's what the Judaizers said to Paul in Romans 5 through 8. And they said, Paul, you can't talk about grace so much. You can't, can't do, you got to keep the lid on these people. They're vermin. They'll take advantage of it every single time. They'll do Christianity light. <laughs> and Paul says to them, thank you so much, Judaizers. I really appreciate it. And I, I know you're sincere. And again, I'm paraphrasing out of the NIV. Um, <laughs> He says, you know what? Uh, these vermin that you talk about, they're not vermin. They, have, they literally have Christ in their heart. They have the Holy Spirit. They don't want to get away with anything. The only thing that um, makes them rebel and get anesthetized is your bad religion.
that makes them buck up and try harder and strive and fail until they run away. You, 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 can, get, you can get right behavior by two different ways. You can get it from compliance, or you can get it from heartfelt obedience that wants to obey. And you can't do that except for, except for that take grace. That take grace. He sees me, and I am clean, holy, righteous, beloved because of his redemption in the cross and the resurrection. That means we can be done with the loser language. It's okay. It's, it, that, that was cute, but it, that's, I'm so sick and tired of hearing, oh, yes, less of me, more of him. Oh, yes, less of me. Here I go, I'm getting smaller. Little wee little man. Not much to say. He's, let's not see him. Let's not see him at all. Oh, gosh, he's almost gone. <laughs> More of Jesus. You know what? That whole verse, that was for one person, and it was about his role, not his person. It's not for you. He wants Christ in you magnified to show the world. That's what he's wanting. You know what this also means? It means I get to come out into the light and I get to be out of the doghouse. A um, long time ago, Stacy's on a health kick for about the last decade. <laughs> but a long time ago, and I don't know if it was Halloween time or what, she, she went to Costco and she wanted to get some Twix bars. And so everything is in large quantities there. So she brought home like 11,000 Twix bars. You know? <laughs> Actually, it was eight. And over the course of the next day, in hiddenness, I ate all eight of them. <laughs> I don't know if this is urban legend or if I actually did. I really believe that's true. And she asked one day, hey, hey where are the Twix bars? And I said, I don't know. I know I had a couple of them. How good would it be if we could just say, because of all I just said, that I could say to Stacy, I ate all eight of them. <laughs> you have married a sick man. <laughs> I'm so sorry, it's too late now, but, but and I may eat eight more. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> but you know who you're not married to? A man who's hiding. That's sick, crazy, weird, but not hidden. Perhaps you'd like me more hidden. You know. Here, have a Twix bar. Oh, I'm sorry. They're all gone, aren't they? <laughs> sorry. Oh, you guys, there's not much better than experiencing believing that you're clean. And, uh, by, by the way, do you know that you have the capacity to remind each other of this? God gives you that to turn them from shame to God for healing through loving them and reminding them who they are and affirming them and blessing them. All of us are awakening to the pain of realizing I can't control my world the way I thought I could. I'm stuck with unresolved issues whose symptoms I'm trying to fix all without the help of anybody else. What if there was a place like the sanctuary, like your home, like your friendships, like you and your career? What if there was a place so safe that the worst of me could be known and I would discover I would not be loved less, but instead I'd be loved more in the telling of it? Do you know what happens? Your issues begin to be resolved. I'll end with this. Um, what if the shed blood of Jesus was this strong? 
See, I, I used to imagine when I first came to Jesus that I felt so close, I felt like I could touch him, like he, I felt so close, but then the things I said I wouldn't do, I did. The things I said I'd do, I didn't do. Romans 7, I, 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 and this mound of sin seemed like it was growing. And suddenly it seemed like Jesus wasn't here anymore and he had walked around over to the other side of my sin and this mound of pus, this, this crap, this stuff that had just kept growing of my stuff. It smelled like three-week-old wet cat food mixed with mayonnaise. It just is, and, and it's hissing, it's pus, and I can't see him anymore. And I, I want to yell out, I imagine his arms are folded. I can't see him, but I imagine he's thinking, gosh, I had so much hope for this kid. He's let me down so many times, no more, no more, no more. And I want to yell out, hey, I'm going to really work, I love you, you I'm going to work on this now. I'm going to make this mound smaller, and you and I are going to get closer and closer and closer. But the truth is, um, there's nothing I can do to make that mound smaller. And the truth is, the, the truckloads of it are being brought in more each week. And the truth is, when I wear a mask, only my mask gets loved. What if the shed blood of Jesus was this strong that for all of us who have even put a fragile hope in Jesus Christ, he walks all the way around from my sin and comes all the way up and he stands right in front of me, like 18 inches away from my face and he puts his hands on my shoulders and he smiles that smile that no other human can make and he says, I know, kid, I know, I'm not mad, I'm not ashamed, I'm not disgusted. I love you so much, I'm crazy about you. And then he'd pull me into a bear hug, like so tight, it's so tight. I, I want to say, stop, you don't get, you got the, stop, you got the wrong person. I don't, I don't deserve this, stop. And he keeps holding me so tight and he keeps whispering, I got you, I so got this, I love you. I've seen this before the world began. I see how it ends, I've got you. And he keeps holding me so tight. And at some point, I don't want him to stop. I've waited for this my whole life. And he keeps whispering, I got you, kid. He keeps holding me so tight until he's absolutely convinced I believe him. And then, and only then, does he begin to loosen his grip. And then only so much so that he can put his arm around me. And we can look at that mound together. Now I've done this, every time I say these words, I imagine this scene, Jesus here, his arms around me, my sins over there, and I always imagine Jesus going, <clears throat> <laughs> wow. <laughs> oh, my, oh my gosh. Uh, Wow, that's a lot of sin. Like, don't you ever sleep? And then he would say, and we're going to deal with it, kid, when you're ready. And five, and four, and three, and two, and one. This is your Jesus. Don't let any other Sin management, lie, break its way through. We get to be on the front lines of this beautiful, beautiful day where the cards all get turned over and the tired and the weary come running home. Thank you, guys.